Tetragrammaton. Chatham, New Jersey, about a half hour outside of the city. And um, my dad owned a record store down in Red Bank, down the shore by, you know, sort of Springsteen country, you know? And um, one of the guys that worked there was a guy in a band called Monster Magnet, remember them? I love Monster Magnet. Yeah, so Monster Magnet, it's, it's Dave, and Wine then there was a guy yes. named, God, I can't even remember his name anymore. It's sad, I can't remember, it was so long ago. He worked at my dad's store. Wow. And the other guy worked at the comic book shop in Red Bank. Because they weren't, you know, you look at, it's so funny when you're young and you see like, a, like someone in a band. Yeah. Mentally, you're like, that person must have everything in the world. You think they live in a mansion and they've got piles of girls around them and da -da -da, and everything is going PG Keen. And like these two guys who I like looked up to and their music and all that stuff were like, one worked at my dad's record store and the other guy worked at the comic book shop selling me Dark Knight comic books and stuff, you know? And, and uh, that was actually great to see, you know, to know that it like changed your perception of what success was because it isn't those things, the mansions and the cars and the this and the that. It's, it's just the fact that they got to, to make music and they did whatever they could to make music. And um, it's very hard to define exactly what, what, what success really truly, truly is. I mean, I, I was born with no options. Like I can, my earliest memories of growing up were about creating and being struck by images, ref, like reference material. I started hoarding reference material in kindergarten. Like I, I, I remember there was like a time where I learned to tie my shoes and my teacher gave me this sticker of a, of a dragon and it was like the body and the head and the arms and the tail were all separate and you could kind of do it. And I was so proud of this sticker and I, not, not because I had tied my shoes, I just like, I just loved the way it looked and I couldn't explain why, but I lost one of the arms in class during the day. And I was so upset that I didn't have that arm anymore for this thing. I couldn't find it and she wouldn't give me another one. And I've kind of just been like, not to sound cheesy, but just kind of been like looking for that arm my entire life, I you know? When we're first grade, Battlestar Galactica and the Muppets were like a really big thing. And I, you know, I, the day, the morning after Battlestar Galactica would come on, me and my friend would sit and have like a, ba a drawing battle to like replicate what we saw the day before. And I had, Was everyone in your school into the same stuff or would you say you had particular interests? I was such an outcast. Like Even at, from the From, from the, the very start. Like there was no moment of going to school for me that was pleasant, mm -hmm. except for things like that. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there was like a, I remember I had this great third grade teacher that read us James and the Giant Peach, that book, and she would bring us snickerdoodle cookies that she made us and read it to the class. And just, I just remember sitting there and, and visualizing that story in my brain as she was reading it to us. And she was in my, you know, you, if this skewed memory, but I, I thought she was probably like the most beautiful woman in the world. And she was telling me this story and she was feeding me cookies. And it was just like those little things really stuck with me. What was your home life like at that time? 
it was, it was, you know, my parents are great people. My mom's an interior designer, and still is. Um, and my father, when I was growing up, worked in the printing business um, until I was about, you know, 12. Mm -hmm. He worked in Manhattan and, you know, I had a great childhood. It was, I lived in an idyllic town with, you know, suburbs, super suburbs. Yeah. Like as suburban as it could possibly Did be. All the houses look the same as each other when you walk in down certain the parts. We lived in a really cool house because my mother was into, to designing homes. It was like, uh, this beautiful home made out of field stones that were pulled from the Passaic river that ran through our town. So, cool. so it was actually a really beautiful house. They still live there. It was great. My house was great. I had two friends that were super solid and everybody else thought I was insane. Yeah. And I just, I didn't know why I couldn't understand it, but I, I didn't try to make people like me. I just did my thing mm -hmm. and, you know, was in my head a lot and drawing a lot and just staying in my lane. And I was always kind of finding things like almost too early. I don't know. I was, had a way of like finding music and things years and years before they meant anything to the world. Mm -hmm. So I found a lot of, you know, peace in those places. And your brothers or sisters? I have a little brother, but he's like seven years older than me or seven years younger than me. So like, you know, the first stretch of life was just me and my best friend, Don, who, uh, who, our parents met in Lama's class. So we were basically like twin brothers, wow. you know, um, spent all of our time there. He just came to visit me last weekend, you so know? Cool. It was Ronald Reagan, for our Jimmy Carter, and then Ronald Reagan. I re really remember Ronald Reagan being elected president and sitting with my father in the living room at, uh, on election night, drawing campaign posters for Reagan and like hanging them on the walls in the living room because I wanted my dad loved Reagan and I wanted to you know I you want to you have a close I, I was close to my dad and I wanted to impress him so I was drawing wrong I still actually have some of those drawings um all my memories are about like music and drawing and hoarding pictures um magic catalogs and I held them like, you know, little secret Bibles mm -hmm. and I wouldn't show this stuff to anybody. Mm -hmm. It was like, I was always kind of hiding stuff. I would make like boxes and draw skulls and crossbones on them, like keep out stuff and hide the stuff inside those boxes. I did it with my candy. I would like take old coffee cans and draw tape paper around them, make them look really nice and draw skull and crossbones on them and hide candy Would and you then know hide where them. things were. Oh yeah, I knew exactly where everything was, but it was I keep I still do. I keep if you ask me to like find a matchbox car that I still have, I could go find it for you within thirty seconds. You know, I'm I'm very organized in, in here from especially for visual things, you know. And Tell me, let's talk more about hoarding. Was it always to be able to get back to it, to reference it, or was it about something else? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I probably just found a lot of solace in this stuff because it was my mine, mm -hmm. you know? And when you say mine, do you mean physically mine or this is an example of my taste? It was my taste, and I felt like I was the only person in the world that had it. Yeah. And it was always skulls that were the most important. When I would go through these catalogs and, and find a skull, it was like, ugh, like, oh my God. And I would just study it and study it and draw it and draw it, draw it and draw it and draw it again. And like I said, I still, luckily my mom kept most of, most of my stuff, so I have a lot of it. What's the first time you saw a physical skull? My best friend Don's dad had one. I don't, and it was in their kitchen and uh, they had all these cats and ferrets and it was like a really great house to hang out in. Um, live or stuffed? Uh, live. Oh, okay. But, and then like, uh, there was just so many cats 
in their house and eventually like a goat and all kinds of like cool and we have uh his mom had a skunk like it was really strange and it was the 70s like people just kind of did stuff. I remember showing up in school in like fifth grade, I had a British flag t-shirt, with no sleeves that I bought in the city. And I showed up at school and like, that was one of the worst days of my entire life. Like the reaction yeah. at school. And then sure as shit, like, you know, six months later, every kid had a t-shirt. Like I was, I like had checkerboard vans people would come and pour stuff on them on purpose and pick on me and steal them and throw them in the trees, you know, just stuff like that. That was what it was like at school, but I didn't really care. I wasn't like sitting there crying. I, I don't know, I, I really appreciate that that happened to me at this point in my life. Probably really, it was probably really hard at the time, but it definitely made me be me, yeah. you know? And um, it's not like a poor me thing. I'm not saying these things because I feel bad for myself. Yeah. There's, it's not, well, it probably wasn't the only kid it was happening to. It feels that way when it's happening to you. But I got into Run DMC. I went to see the Ice Capades with my dad at MSG. And then Tower, you know, used to, I believe it stayed open until midnight. Mm -hmm. And so my dad is a massive, massive music fan, jazz primarily. And like, um, you know, jazz singers, uh, cabaret singers, stuff like this, country. And so we went there and you obviously- Fourth and Broadway? Yeah, went down there. Jazz section upstairs. Yes. He went up there, Tower had those incredible displays that they made. You know, it wasn't like the record company because they were the only store that had those things and they were amazing. And I walked in and I saw the first Run DMC album. So this was pro that was probably like 84, I think is when it came out. And I was always allowed to pick a record and I bought that and uh, a tape because I was really into my Walkman. So I wanted the tape. And um, then you did, maybe a couple years later, you did a record with them. And that was when I first heard of you and saw a picture of you. And I was like, who the hell is that guy? And you kind of kept putting all this stuff out, dice and PE and just these things that no one I was around was listening to at all. Nobody knew who any of these people were. And I would like break dance in my backyard on this giant piece of cardboard by myself, like listening to these, you know, especially Run DMC and LL Cool J were like the thing. And then I, I in 87 Christmas break, this kid gave me the first Boogie Down album. And that was like a whole other stratosphere of, oh my God. I wanted to make this feel, it revealed itself to me that it should be kind of like a movie, this series of work. We start with these like three pictures here, which are very loose and gestural and fuzzy-ish. And I kind of treated these as though they were almost like titles playing in, in the beginning of a movie, right? Where it's like kind of setting a scene. And these three paintings were done on white backgrounds where the 93 other paintings were paintings that started on a black background and you draw, you pull the pictures out of it. When you work on white, you apply it on top of it. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference that happens in these first three. So I kind of wanted to like set this scene of this environment of this place where people are eating and music is being played and people seem, they seem to be having a good time. You've got, this is called the master of ceremonies, this painting, and he's, he's setting the scene. 
Obviously, we've been talking about music a lot. It's a big, big, big part of my life. I grew up in these in rooms that like this, like going to the Algonquin room in New York and 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 all the jazz clubs downtown and whatever. Like those were they're familiar to me. These interior scenes and these well-dressed people and I'm calling them people. I know they have skeleton faces, but they're, they're, they're people. Would you know what this room looks like that they're in? Like, could you imagine the space they're in? Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually want to like, kind of want to make it physically make it. I might make one in here, like a little one, mm -hmm. um, like a sound stage almost. What else were you listening to besides hip hop at that time? Super into Bad Brains, Misfits, um, Black Flag, JFA, The Cramps, um, Minor Threat. You know, I was listening to what I was seeing in Thrasher. Mm -hmm. The Misfits were from Jersey, obviously Skulls, and the music was so next level. And also with that, you know, the, the movie element of it was really interesting to me, the influence of the movies on the song titles and the, what the songs were about. And I was obsessed with The Misfits. I'm still obsessed with The Misfits. Did you ever get um, to see them live? No, I never went. I never went. Um, Good show. I'm sure. <laughs> it's like, I can't put into words how important the misfits are to me and like what they did to my brain was like i'm still dealing with it you know yeah. and i loved elvis my dad still had probably still does have like his 45s from uh when he was a kid and i would sit with him and listen i'd be like dad can we go upstairs and get the elvis seven inches out of that closet and he'd be like all right and i'd dance you know and, and uh so danzig was like kind of just I, I was so happy a few years ago when danzig finally like just threw it down and was like did an elvis covers album and it's fantastic i love it i listen to it all the time um he was able to marry so many things all of which were things you were into all of them. Yeah, everyone. I listened to it on albums and, that I still have, and, and like it sounds one way, and I listen to it on Spotify, and it sounds another way. I love Spotify. I think it's just fantastic to just have that. So convenient. All the time. Like, I, I'm not a, yeah, I want it to be, I want things to be convenient. Spotify, really. Like, the day I heard about that, I was like, yep, I'll do that. And you're able to just transfer back to all these things. And I could be driving in some place. I don't have my records, but I really want to hear Minor Threat right now. And I can, mm -hmm. that's fantastic. Cause I still kind of just, I listen to some new music, but I still really just mostly listen to that stuff. Like I really loved early U2 as well, like at that time, like October and, and, and uh, boy, those records were really important to me. Um, having a record store, like my dad like bought this used record store in, in Red Bank and then it was just like, you know, that was my weekend job was to get up, go down to the store with him and work. and. I spent all of my time with him in Manhattan on the weekends going through J&R and all these little record stores and, um, you know, around Bleecker, Bleecker Bob's and all these places. And, and uh, but then to be able to just be like, walk into a record store, this is my record store. You know, I, you know, it's my dad's, but it's mine too, I guess, you know. And he sold bootlegs where we would, you know, some, he had these cases of like dead shows and Zeppelin shows and Black Sabbath shows and blah, 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 blah. And I, my, one of my jobs would be like, someone would come in and be like, I want this concert. And I would have to sit there and dub it for them. And then they'd come back a couple hours later and, 
and get the tape. And I'd have to like photocopy it and cut it, put it into the tape for them and stuff like that. And then he sold posters, which was another massive way of gaining all this insight into visual information about like live tour posters and stuff. A lot of Morrissey posters and Cramps posters and bands that were doing stuff like still at that time. And we would, he would buy these posters from these suppliers in Europe that would send them like poster delivery day was always really exciting to like see what was coming. And, and uh, yeah, I would just sit there and just and then bootleg like albums too. You remember like the old, like uh, there was like a lot of Zappa bootlegs that I really liked and um, Zappa was another one I got into really, really early. And uh, cause he kind of had like a minor, maybe it wasn't a hit, but I heard it on the radio that like, don't eat the yellow snow song. And then my best friend Don's dad bought us the tape of, uh, that's Joe's Garage, I believe, right? That, that that's on? Don't know. I think so. And um, so we'd listen to that in the car driving around. Zappa. What was the culture of the record store? Like, would the same people be the people who would come to buy records? Or It was cool. It was like, there was a little community down there. Like, I, that was where I had some friends, too. There was, like, some skaters because it was the beach. So, like, I knew some kids and kissed a girl and stuff like that, you know, like, which I would never get the opportunity <laughs> to in my town. And um, yeah, it was a lot of regulars. Some guys that would come in and just stand there all day and tell you the same stories and da da da. And that, but like Bon Jovi came in one day, you know, that was like, I, that was really cool. Yeah. You know, Bruce Springsteen would come into my dad's record store. That's that true. was really cool. Seeing the guys from Monster Magnet have jobs, seeing Bruce Springsteen in my dad's store, it just humanized heroes really early for me, which was really great, you know? And like, I look at my life now and I'm sitting here with you. I like the people who I have relationships with in my life are like people who are operating at like, the highest levels of whatever it is that they do. And some of them might be wildly fucking famous or they make, they write movies and nobody knows who the hell they are, but they're like the best at it. And like, I feel really lucky that I saw this. I don't have this like fear of, or idolize like famous people and shit. I just, I, I don't know what's the right way to put this. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Absolutely. Just they're just people. It, and they are. And that was your experience from childhood. And you yeah. got to see it early, which yeah. takes away this. I think it could be a limiting uh, belief if you feel like the only people who have success in the arts are special people yes. and they're not like us. Yeah. That's not true. It's not even remotely true. It's I not mean, remotely it, true. I mean, you have to probably, as a producer, I would imagine a lot of what you see it, or have to do is witness the psychological traumas of the people that are creating music because it is psychologically traumatic to create. And that's the best part of it, I think, is, is having those fears, those doubts. You don't want that to go away but you want to fight through it. You want to get through it. And you want to uh, now, like at this point in my life, I come into the studio with no agenda and no plan. And I don't want one mm -hmm. at all. Zero plan. I have this series I've been working on. It's over the last little over the last year and a couple of months. And I have one more painting to do which I'll start later today. And I have no idea. And then it'll be, and then the series is done? Yeah. And I have, I have no idea what that painting is yet. Mm. And I don't care. Yeah. Like it will absolutely tell me what it needs to be mm -hmm. at like five o'clock tonight. And I'll sit down in my studio at my house. It'll just happen. So these are some of the, this one is one of the earliest ones 
I painted this one really right at the beginning. And then these others kind of followed. This one I actually just made like two weeks ago. And yeah. interesting, his teeth look like they're letters of some sort. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all like the teeth. I've drawn and painted so many skulls that I don't even try to make teeth anymore. I just want to make the suggestion of something. Mm -hmm. The first time I really made that happen in a meaningful way to myself that I can recall is this, this, is, just four lines yeah and the red and i don't know why they have this red but they had to mm -hmm. they just had to mm -hmm. when you started how much of the story did you have none of it so you show up the first day is this the very first painting no the first one is over there we'll okay, get we'll to get it there. okay it's a very you show up the first day tell me what happens the first day i have this image I take a photocopy of it and I like do a rough sketch, kind of tracing out the, the figures. On a piece of paper? No, onto a canvas. Okay. I can like transfer. Life size? Yeah, like uh, directly onto the canvas. This canvas is this big. Oh, I see. It's really small. And I just got these figures on there and I hung it on the wall and I sat down and within like, I don't think it took me more than three hours. It was like, there, painting was done. Minus like, oh, this little thing needs this and this. I like, and then I, and I kind of got back from it and I was like, it's like, I, I, I don't know what I just did here, but I really, really like it. I don't, I'm not a sketchbook guy. I'm not like a, a sit around and draw or, for no reason. Mm -hmm. Like if I make a drawing, it's like going to be a final piece of artwork. It's not like, um, yeah, I'm not, I don't do sketches. Mm -hmm. I need my reference materials. I need my music and my coffee and my environment to be right. And then I just do it. 80% of the paintings that I've made are done in my brain, 100% finished paintings. And all I have to do is sit down and apply them to the canvases. And that's basically where I've gotten with it. So you see the picture before you begin? Absolutely, I can see it crystal. Mm -hmm. I don't have any doubt of what it's going to become. See so yeah, we started, these were really just like, there's gonna be some flowers. There's gonna be some flowers. And then, you know, as it progresses, the flowers become tighter, the, everything kind of, we get to these first four little scenes of this and, you know, very nice, sort of that, but more rendered. And then there's a, this outside shot of this castle where this is taking place. All of this is taking place in here. And there's this minion of the devil lighting this pyre to show him where to go, right? So the painting we're seeing is the painted rendition of something that you see not as a painting, you see it as a scene. Yeah. First, almost like a photograph first. Yeah. Or I could see a specific, an actual photo that someone took or that I find or whatever, yeah. like that's yeah. what I start with, source. Yeah. I work from source material. Have you done many paintings with paintings in them? No, this is the first time. First in time. This, in this Series. body of work is really, as far as I can recall, the first time I've ever done it. And I absolutely loved doing it. It's been effortless to spend time in front of these paintings. Yeah. That's, that's the best way to describe it. And like the amount of work that can happen in what seems like a really short period of time. Um, obviously that comes with years and years of experience and confidence and having a vision and a clear, clear understanding of the materials and also having 
the willingness to know how little you actually know every time you get up to one of these things. Tell me the process. Where does it start? Does it start with you have an idea and then you draw something or does it start standing in front of a canvas? It's never the same, I, I guess. You know, this particular thing I'm working on is I decided to take like the White Album and the Wall and every other double fucking album of all time and try to make them all. You know, I've made 96 paintings in a year. That's, that's not normal, right? It's not what I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. I've never made a series this big. I've never made a series of paintings that has like a, like a story through it all. There's, a, there's definitely a narrative to it. This was spawned by seeing a lobby card from uh, an old serial. Um, Which one? It's called the Moon Riders, and the films do not exist. All that's left is the lobby cards? the lobby cards and like a couple of posters, and like I found, you know, I, I rabbit holed trying to find as much of this stuff as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. There isn't any, there's just like nothing. I have like 10 images that mm -hmm. sort of spawned all of this. Um, probably like six I found on a Tumblr once, and then I dug around finding old poster collectors and calling them. And I found a guy that had some and I bought them. So I made a painting, one little painting, a nine by 12 inch painting. And uh, I showed it to somebody who I had a sort of a working relationship with. I was like, I'm thinking about making like a series of these. And he was like, don't do that. No, it's a terrible idea. Don't do that. And I was like, that's what I'm definitely going to do, yeah. you know? One of my greatest ways of getting through life is considering the source, right? Mm -hmm. Of what this inform who it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And you kind of go, well, actually, like, there's nothing aspirational about, uh, I don't look up to you for anything, yeah. really, you know? Um, so I don't trust your opinion and I'm going to trust my gut because that's all I've got. You that's know it. that really, really well. So I just kind of started making some and then I showed them to, uh, I was texting one night with Damien Hurst and just about whatever, catching up. And towards the end of it, I sent him that painting, the first one, and he was like, whoa, what's that? And then I sent him another one. And he really responded very positively to what I was doing. He's somebody who I greatly respect mm -hmm. and trust mm -hmm. and has been remarkably generous to me in my life and helped me in ways that I can't understand. When did you first meet him? 2013, he was introduced to my stuff and, and wanted to get some, he, I had this book that had come out and my friend gave him the book via our mutual friend. He was like, oh, I'd love to get that painting. And I was like, there's n none of those paintings are available. They're all gone. Mm -hmm. They're just in a book, but I'm making these new ones for this museum exhibition I was having. And uh, we worked something out and he ended up like purchasing these paintings for me. That was really, you know, motivational. What are the ways that you feel like Damien changed the game? I can only speak to how he changed the game for me. Okay. He taught me how to value myself. Um, and he taught me a lot about methods of creating that I hadn't considered in the past. He changed the game by doing those things. I don't know that I should actually speak to them because they're, I don't know if it's, it doesn't, it's, he's just pushed things in a way that no one else can do it. I can't do it. It's impossible for me to do it. I cannot do it. He took methods of working that, you know, Warhol did, but the, like having this sort of factory thing and took it to such a different level of polish and shine and glitz and glam and 
fuck yous that no one's ever done, you know? And I love his work, love it. I'm, I, all of it, because I understand why it's there. It's important. It's like a, an album that everybody hates by a band and you, you know they had no choice but to make that. He's somebody that doesn't have a choice. He's got to do it. You can't explain it. I don't want to explain his paintings. I don't want to explain my painting. I don't know what they're... I, I don't want to tell you what my paintings are about. Mm -hmm. My dad came here on Sunday with me to see this stuff and walked around and looked at it. And he was, he asked me like what it was about. And I know he like wanted an answer. Like it wasn't able, I wasn't able to be like, I don't, I don't want to tell you. I couldn't, that's my dad. Of course. Um, so we, I didn't answer him. I was like, look around at it one more time. And he didn't. I don't know. He's old and it's on a cane. You know, whatever. I understood why he couldn't do it or didn't do it. And then I went home and I started working in my studio I have at home and then jumped out of my chair, ran in and found him. He was on the phone. I was like, put your phone call on mute. I can tell you what the paintings are about. And um, I kind of was able to tell him what all my paintings are about, I guess, which is we are told that we are living in this world of divisiveness and upheaval and uncertainty and fear and just tragedy all around us, right? That's what we are told we are doing, correct? That's yes. the way it's presented to yes. us. I want to make artwork that shows you that that is not true, that we are living in a world filled with unbearable amounts of love, unbearable amounts of gratitude. It is, I, I couldn't pick a better time to be alive than right now. It's magnificent out there like everybody else have anxieties about things and visions of the worst case scenarios and blah, 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 blah. But I don't live in those places. I, I, I can acknowledge them. They'll hit me. Mm -hmm. I say something to myself. I, I, I um, acknowledge the, the love that I have inside myself and how deeply rooted and connected that is to every other person on this planet. And um, keep moving. Yeah. That's all I can do. So I want to give people a glimpse of that, mm -hmm. that that is possible mm -hmm. to live that way, because I live that way. And I wish that all I can do, I can't wish that everybody lived that way. All I can do is hope for myself to give people examples of that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's it. This is one of the harder ones. This was, this one took harder, meaning it, it, it was There was never a doubt that I was going to get there. Just yeah. the road was really long to get there, to get yeah. those glasses to be, I wanted them to be perfectly imperfect. Mm -hmm. And for the stacks of glasses to somehow make total sense and absolutely no sense at all. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was really challenging. So is this the first one we've seen where it's the black background to start? Uh, no, these three, these four oh, little these guys all started on black as I well. See. Yeah, everything post this piano player is done on that, mm -hmm. that black. This one I'm holding actually was going to be the fourth one of, of that. How many hours can you spend on a painting? Like in a day, 
how much time can be painting? I'm good for like four to nine hours, depending on the day. Um, because you can really accomplish quite a lot in four hours mm -hmm. if you're just painting. Mm -hmm. If it was a four hour session, would it always be four hours straight or might it be two hours and then go do something and then come back and do two hours? The beauty of it is not having to have, I don't have to have a schedule to make paintings. That's one of the yeah. greatest parts of making art. As there in terms is of momentum, is there some benefit of if something's working to get when it's through. working, you just, I just stay. Yeah. I just stay. Yeah. I'd say an average day is six to seven hours mm -hmm. of like continuous painting mm -hmm. without stopping besides to, you know, grab a sandwich or mm -hmm. go to the bathroom or ch change the music. But I'm staying Always on purpose. I'm staying music. on the purpose. Always paint with music. It used to be. 100% of the time, I'd say now it's 20% podcasts. Always listening to something. And then, but also I'd say 30% silence. Mm. I've been doing a lot of silent painting. So in order, will this one be before this one? Or After this one? this one. This, it'll go this one, this one, and this one sort of introduces this, this woman into it. And you can see the piano player becomes rather, from my way I see it, is he is quite enamored with her, not just because she's naked, just her, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. When I was painting those drums over and over in my head, I just kept saying to myself, our Blakey, our Blakey, our Blakey, our Blakey. Like I wanted to make a drum set that he would want to play. And it doesn't, much like those champagne glasses, it is not right. Yeah. But you could play them. Mm -hmm. You could see how to play them, I think. Mm -hmm. I could see how to play them. Mm -hmm. And I don't play drums. Mm -hmm. But, uh... That's why. Really enjoyed, <laughs> really enjoyed. Yeah, that's why they, they make sense to me. But yeah, it's, uh... I love those drums. I was really had a blast with this one. I, I like, and these, like, these tabletops... This one in particular, I was almost like, you know, I wanted to paint like a water lilies painting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's the table. That was really, these are, these three guys drinking with the paintings and the paintings and the wallpapers and everything. Some of the greatest moments I've ever had in my life mm. creating these paintings. It was fun to paint the, the wine. Like this guy is a little, like almost like deciding whether he's gonna have a drink. Mm -hmm. He's what well, he's really to me. He's drinking. Mm -hmm. They're really thinking of something, and this guy is no question just ready to party. Mm -hmm. To me, <laughs> like he's really there to throw down. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this guy, the hand shows trepidation yes yeah and a look in his eye and yeah i i i've made a life of painting skulls and having skulls do things but this series like i really i said i keep calling them guys and people and so like they they really feel alive to like I'm looking at these like they're like the, the crimson ghost you know yeah I met you a handful of years ago but in 2018 I remember reaching out to you and coming over to your house and or up to Shangri-La and talking to you and and you invited me back to to meet Krishna Das and through that experience I was able to go meet Ram Das and I don't know if I've ever properly thanked you for that. I don't even think you want me to thank you for that, but thank you. That was like the most magical thing and nothing happened. You know, I know there's like a little documentary that was put out kind of shortly before he passed away 
where it just shows him going to the beach with a group of people, going swimming, and then going back and sitting in this room in his house and looking out the window. And that's exactly what I did. I met him on the beach in Maui, went for a swim, held hands with him on the beach. He stared at me in a way, I mean, I'm about to cry, you know. And then went to his house the next day, had a, my friend Will Welsh was interviewing him for GQ. Great. And we sat for three hours in his study. Will was interviewing him. But he and I looked at each other in the eye for three hours. And anything that was wrong with my life went away that day. Mm. And I'm not, it's like things will come up and they'll be bad. Of course. But God, did I learn how to deal with them better after that experience, you know? I've always studied and read and I was introduced to Ram Dass as a pretty young kid from my mother gave me be here now because, you know, I, I knew she knew I would be into the, she knew I'd be into the pictures. And she was listening to his lectures and on tapes. And I have all of those now too, which Amazing. is really great. I knew all these things, but to sit with him and have him reflect back to me and Will and the world, I guess, eventually when he put, when the interview came out, he, Will started off, Ramdas had sort of a, a go-to explanation of himself, right? Where he would talk about going and being at Harvard and da-da-da, and, and then like Will asked him a specific question, and I can't recall what it was, it doesn't matter, but he, like it, it clicked in him like, oh, I don't have to be like Ramdas magazine article version of myself, I can just talk to these guys. And then it was like magic got real, hour. Got real. This guy who is so incredibly devoted to this loving awareness in the world is still gets pissed off at people and has bad feelings towards people and bad feelings about himself and better. And it's just like, he, you know that, but to hear it really come out of his, see him say it like this close, yeah. like see him say it. He's human. Yeah. He's still human. Yeah. And like, he's one of the only people though, that like he is, he was somebody I couldn't look at that way. Yeah. He was too important. He knew too much. Yeah. He, Cause that's what you got when you read the books and stuff and listened to him talk. It was like, he didn't have a goddamn thing figured out except the love yeah. and how to stay there. And that's all we can do. Mm -hmm. It's actually pretty easy once you realize that, you know? I know you're very interested in those thought processes and all those things as well. And that's why I had called to reach out to see you originally is I, I needed to talk to somebody because mm. I was going through all kinds of shit and I couldn't talk my way out of it, right? I'm not fooling myself to think that I've got it figured out just because I met Ramdas and he made me feel a certain way. Staying in the practice of doing this stuff really helps to keep my, my anxiety is almost zero now. I, I, you know, it's the only way I'll get a little anxious is if I don't eat enough and have too much coffee. And that's a very easy thing to fix. Just eat something. Would you say you were more anxious in the past? I went through a really long period of, um, you can very easily, easily correlate anxiety and financial success where they just went and exploded. And I had, I was living in a state of um, crippling panic attacks um, where like Will, Welsh was somebody who um, was like my speed dial, who I could call when I was really losing it. Because when you have a panic attack, it feels like the entire world is just 
<laughs> I had had them when I was younger, but I wasn't living in a state of them, you know? And I was living in a state of them. I was just, I was selling every painting I could make to every single person on the planet that meant something. And I was fucking miserable. So it was in success that you had the panic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I have no self-worth whatsoever. Zero. I don't expect to sell paintings. I've come to a much different place with it. I'm good with it now. I look at it totally differently. Mm -hmm. But at that point in time, it's really easy to, to understand it. I was drinking, smoking cigarettes, eating pizza and hamburgers and treating myself really, really, really badly. I thought I knew what like these books and stuff were about. They were very much a part of my life. I was I was reading them. I thought they were getting in. I wasn't letting them permeate me properly, you know? I and I it's a life's pursuit to to let them do that for you. But so, I don't know, so a bunch of different things happen and they it's clicked more, right? Some of the things that I see in these books my favorite being the Tao is like the one that I that really resonates with me. I'm, I wouldn't call myself a Taoist. I just practice my version of the Tao. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I, I don't want any rigidity in it, you know, and mm -hmm. it's like I can't define it for anybody, but I know how I practice it. Yeah. I know how I meditate. Yeah. I know how I study these words and I know what they do for me. I think the nature of the Tao is so open to interpretation anyway, that if you read this, you can read the words and then read them a year later and they'll mean something completely totally different. Totally different. Uh, what I do is I wake up every morning and that's how I start my day. I, I give myself 10 minutes of perfect quiet and breathing mm -hmm. and staring out a window that's up high in my room. Do you do this in bed or do you get out of bed? No rule. Typically, Some, just describe typically. How I usually it wake up, woken up usually because my I have a little I have a two year old son, so his noise will wake me up. My wife usually is the one that will go in and see him first, and I'll just sit there and breathe for ten minutes and laugh and listen to what's happening in the other room. Then I'll read a verse of the Tao. I actually open my phone and read, there's a Ramdas app. And every day there's these words of wisdom. There's two, two to three of them every day. Mm -hmm. I read those first, then I read my Tao verse. And then I'm ready to go. I'm up and I go see my son, Otto, and, uh, that kid is success, bro. My wife walked in here into my studio one day. A mutual friend brought her along on a studio visit randomly and I went outside in the parking lot to open the gate and this girl opened the back seat of the SUV they got driven here in and stepped out and I literally lost my breath. I was just like, is that and now I'm married to her and have a son Congratulations. and it's thanks and uh yeah that's success man that love I never wanted it I saw my friends that had kids and I'm I'm, I'm gonna guess you probably you probably felt this way you like look at your friends that have kids and you're like ha like you're sucks for you you don't get to go do this you don't get to go do that and like luckily i did get to go do all the things mm -hmm. now i'm in my 50s i have a two-year-old son and it's like it was the right time for me these two are next 
Yeah, they would be next. It's just sort of like, really, I just want you to be in this moment of like, there, there's people are getting to know each other, they're playing together, mm -hmm. they're like music together, they're eating together, they're getting to, they're meeting each other. It's just this, it's a party. Is the violinist singing to the man or is he telling him a secret? To me, he's not even there. To me, he's more about what I was just talking about. But with, you know, the, with death. That's but, interesting. But it's open to interpretation. That's interesting. Um, for me, that guy is eating, he's passing a lobster as if nothing is going on. Yeah. To me. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like he's keeping a straight face because this guy's telling him something. It's like he's getting inside information is what I see. Well, good. Yeah. <laughs> Two people standing in front of the same thing are going to have this totally Absolutely. different experience with Absolutely. it. And that's what's so much fun, right? Yeah. There is a painting that is not here. It's in my house currently of the devil landing. He's holding an umbrella and his feet are on the ground in the woods. He's been called and he's coming. And this is like, um, that will happen like uh, here, between these three guys and here will be the devil, he's landed. Mm -hmm. And this scene, it's really inspired by the album cover of uh, that song, Fire. What's that guy's name? The, you know, Fire. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, then we'll, we have another real quick glimpse of just the normalcy. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see the piano player starts, he's up here and, and the, the, um, the monkeys are starting to kind of act a little off and they're taking the instruments and swinging and he's got a lobster and whatever. And he's kind of like, and then the monk, the, I really wanted to showcase these monkeys just really going for it. So there's a, there's a fourth monkey painting that this suite of these monkey paintings that's going so on the, with her. These are details of this essentially? Yeah, this is like the first time that the monkeys are really starting to act up. And then I really wanted to like show them going off, going off mm -hmm. you know? And they're eating lobster and drinking and swinging from the chandelier. And mm -hmm. these are some of the, the most challenging ones. These monkeys getting their expressions. Like I can do a skull with my eyes closed. Mm. When did the skulls start for you? First grade. And just started drawing them? Yeah. And you think it started with a drawing or a photograph? A a physical skull or maybe seen in a movie? For me, it was like very specifically like uh, going to this place in New Jersey. It was called Dell's Novelty. And it was a novelty shop yeah, that had like magic, magic, tri shop. magic tricks and party favors and costumes and all that stuff. That guy had all these bins of skulls and the catalogs. He gave me some order books of the stuff and those were like those were the thing those books to order the stuff from mm -hmm. had the illustrations of the skulls yeah they were like kind of similar to what you saw in the backs of comic books mm -hmm. but because some like older weird man had handed me this magical book in this store filled with all this crazy shit yeah that book was way more valuable information to me than what I was seeing in the back of a, of a comic book. Understood. Do you think your mom's um, eye for detail in her work influenced you in any way? A hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, we're almost, we're like facsimiles of each other. It's probably, I look a lot like my mom. Um, do you think it's genetic or do you think it's seeing her do it, her modeling it for you? It's hard to say. My father's super creative too. He's, he writes a 
about jazz. My mom is a, does her thing. My aunt is an art teacher. Like there's creative people. I was just brought up around creative people. Mm -hmm. They definitely didn't encourage me to do this. I can say that. There was a lot of butting heads, like get a job kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. And I just wouldn't do it. I just wouldn't do it. I got a job when I was five at the pharmacy on Sunday mornings, putting newspapers together because the Sunday papers came in sections and you had to put them together. And I wanted comic books and toys and that's how I got them. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not five, eight. I was eight. And then I worked in a rug store, which was all about detail and being around these beautiful rugs. And there was a very specific way to unroll them and a very specific way to re-roll them. And I loved it. And I was really, I took a lot of pride in how I did it. Mm -hmm. And then my dad opened his store and I worked in record stores. And then in my late 20, mid 20s, I started to work at like, sort of like blue chip art galleries in New York City. What motivated you to move west? It was a couple of things, but like I had this idea in Two thousand nine or early ten, that I wanted to come out and um, stay at the chateau and make a series of drawings on that letterhead that you get when you stay there, and they print your name on it, right? What's what started that idea? What was it about? I the had chateau? been there, and I just liked it. You know, it was just like a place. The first time I went there, I was just like, it's so storied and. I like went and stayed there. It was the first time I could like afford to stay in a really nice, nice hotel, mm -hmm. <laughs> expensive hotel. So I flew out to LA and I went there and I didn't have like this crazy time there. I just, I left there feeling like I wanted to be there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I get this room, my home, any other home I've had in, in California and studios I've worked in my, since I haven't been able to have studios. It's like, no matter how, what a dump it is when I walk through the door, there's like, I just get this feeling. The energy. Yeah. And this place was just a disaster area. I bet. And I crossed the halfway point. This building is twice as big. I crossed the halfway point into the building. And I got to the beam that separate, separates the space. It's cut, buried in that wall now. And I looked in here and I got the chills up my spine. Amazing. I was like, this is it. Amazing. You know? Anyway, to go back to, it was like Chateau just felt like a place to be for me. I just needed to be there. I didn't know why. Mm -hmm. So I, long convoluted story as to how I got there. I had nothing to, you know, I had, didn't have a pot to piss in really, but I found the money, I sold some works, I, I got the money and I went, came out here in early 2011 and rented room 34 in the Chateau and uh, lived there like I was supposed to be there because I was How supposed to be there. Work? I stayed for um, 30 days and I made a drawing every day. Mm -hmm. Then I went back to Brooklyn for a couple of weeks and then I f came back and I, I rented the penthouse for a night mm -hmm. and threw an exhibition up there and it did really, really, really well. This was another thing that some person, some people that I was working with in New York had discouraged this idea, to put it lightly. And I was like, well, I'm doing it. Uh, however I can do it, I'm going to do it. I did it and it changed my life, man. Amazing. I met uh, a, a good buddy of mine, Darren Romanelli, in my room at the hotel. He came in and I was listening to a, a live dead show and um, he was, he's a big deadhead and, and we got to talking and he introduced me. He, he helped me get involved in a project for a Grateful Dead box set. And that was all ha happening at Rhino, you know, Warner. And so I kept having to come out here 
for meetings with uh, the producer of, of like the Live Dead rec- uh, releases is a guy named David Lemieux. So I was coming out here, meeting with him. He's like an encyclopedia of Grateful Dead. Um, just a really cool guy. And I'd come out to LA. I would have the I'd stay at the Chateau. I'd have a fantastic time. And then I'd get back to Brooklyn and I would be around a bunch of painters. And there's just too much negativity going on around me. You know, there's like, I don't understand how people have turned art into a fucking competitive sport, but they've figured out a way to do it. Mm-hmm. And I was not willing to play that game. Yeah. So I decided I was turning 40 in 2012 and I just, decided to come and move here. And I moved into the Chateau Marmont. Amazing. I had no plan. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of started drawing and making these like paintings on paper, basically, because that's all I could really pull off in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, did another one night exhibition up in the Belushi bungalow and uh, sold it out. I would say in 10 minutes, literally. It was just like, yes, this, you know, and the next and day. it's not typical for an artist to sell his own work. No, no, that's another, that was, that was something that, that I found that the system that I was presented with to work within was not the one that I was willing to do at the time. Tell me, tell me about the system. I, I really know very little about the art world. What's the typical path? I don't know if there's a typical one, but the relationship between a gallery and an artist is, it can, at the level that I was operating at, Mm -hmm. which was sort of not emerging, but not some, you know, it's like emerging artists and mid-career artists and late-career artists. I was in between emerging and mid. And there's just sort of this like indentured servitude that you feel by the people involved in the gallery system. Do you feel like you work for the gallery when you have a gallery? They try to make you feel that way. Yes. That's not a game I'm going to play. I'm not going to do that. So the very short version of the long story I didn't say is like, I wanted to come to the Chateau. The people I was working with said, no, we're not going to help you financially to do that get a Kickstarter and maybe you can get, and I didn't even know what that was. Mm -hmm. They showed me what that was. I was like, I'm not doing that. You couldn't pay me to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're not going to do it, then you're not doing that project. And I said, I quit (laughs) on the spot. I quit. Yeah. Give me the couple things you have. My truck's outside. Yeah. I'm out. Call the collector. Sold a big painting, got 40 grand in my pocket, and spent it all to live at the chateau for 30 days. And rolled it, and it turned into more than that. Mm-hmm. And then more than that. And then more than, you know, the, these are the sort of the times, though, where I was like getting like anxiety and panicky and tweaky about things. And I just kept, I'd answer the phone and I'd. It would be the best news in the world, and I would have a panic attack. What's a call you would get that would put pressure on you? That was so difficult is because it didn't feel like pressure to me in my mind, but my body felt it that way, I guess, and mm-hmm. my mind subconsciously was doing that to me. I don't know. It was just like so-and-so of world renown would like to come meet you and buy a painting. Okay. And those calls were like, happening like not like once but like weekly you know and i'm so thankful for it yeah i mean yeah yeah. but tell me that tell me where the anxiety came from that what do you think it is i really don't know i mean the only thing i can answer for the only thing that i can think of is having no self-worth of, of any kind. 
I'm a tall guy. I'm covered in tattoos. I'm, I'm relatively well-spoken, but uh, educated enough. I've got a good head on my shoulders and stuff. Financially succeeded in this world. And up to a certain point, I just like hated myself. So that's sort of like the end of act one, for the lack of a better term. And then what happens is like all the guys decide, okay, this devil has arrived and we have to beat it. And so they, this is kind of like, almost like a moment, like a wonder twins activate moment where like they all kind of, they decide to become this band of guys that are going to go out and kill the devil. So these are sort of portraits of all of those gentlemen kind of like, all right, we're going to go do this. And in that, the piano player becomes the main guy. To me, what's happening here is that minion guy from one of the very early paintings mm -hmm has, is helping the devil raise the dead. And that's here? That's what's happening here. I see. That's a really crazy little painting you really need to look at. Like it's not, I love making these small ones. There's such a different skill set than the larger ones, the tightness and, and whatever. I was talking about this little bird and then you see him here. And what I've done, what, for me, what he is doing is presenting these guys with the opportunity to read the Tao. That's what this is. Wow. So if you look at it, there's writing on it, but yes. I'm, I wrote, I wrote, a verse of the Tao across those two pages, but I wrote it in a way that you can't read it, mm -hmm. but it is written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know, this painting has been a real mystery. Yeah, I like it, it very much. It, thank you. Very, it, very much. It, it happened um, really fast. This was like a one where I came in and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna see what happens with this. I found some photograph of two nuns that I liked. Mm -hmm. And there was some, it was just this old black and white photo of two nuns and all these like leaves. Where do you think the light source is in this? This painting is actually called The Fire of Mystery. Yeah, this, this heat, this fire, these scenes of like this red, like darkness with the fire showing or these red skies that happen in the fire reflecting on things that's gonna start, you're gonna start to see a lot. Like I, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> For me, what's happening here is, is this is the night and in the morning He's like saying goodbye to her. He's going to go find the devil and kill him with his friends. And they're saying goodbye. I called this painting the shaman. It's like this, this lobster shaman. The, man, the painting that comes directly after this is this really f fucked up vision painting that I made. Um, so like, that shaman is kind of, he sees that shaman and what he's seeing in his mind is this. This mayhem. This is the first big one. This is the only one this big too. This one's really, this is a large, large painting. So I went from this little postage stamp one to this and then a couple more and then, then I, showed DH and then that's what kind of made the encouragement of his excitement by these was what kind of pushed me to, to really, 
I had the idea, but I, and I, and I saw this as maybe being, you know, 20 paintings, like tell a little story, cute little story that I didn't even know yet. Yeah. I just really wanted to show that I know what it feels like to get inside your head and see the worst possible thing happening. You know, it makes no sense. None of it makes any fucking sense whatsoever. Why you're having the thought doesn't make too much sense. Why it has to be the worst possible thought mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. I don't even know what this is. I have no idea what is happening in this painting. Yeah. But I really had to make it. Yeah. And I really had fun making it. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what the original um, inspiration for the layout was? Was there a source? Uh, well, I had a couple of images of the lobby cards for the Moonriders mm -hmm. serial. So I put them on there and it kind of felt like this weird valley was mm -hmm. happening. I was like, oh, let's put this woman in here. What's that going to be all about? And then I was like, there really should be some lobsters in here. Mm -hmm. I don't know why but they have to be here. And then these different devil heads started floating in and, and it was, I painted it there where those paintings are. Mm -hmm. And I lived there until just a couple of weeks ago when we decided to kind of lay the paintings out into a, an order. Cause I, you know, we're making a, an exhibition catalog. When it's shown in the gallery, it'll be, in order? I hope it will work in the space to be in order. I mean, it's going to be set across six large rooms. Mm -hmm. And how long does the show go up for? I honestly don't know. Haven't asked. Yeah. For me, the devil is about to raise and we're dead. That's what's happening here. And we're in the midst of like our, our hero, um, you know, going on this crazy journey um, where he's really going to be faced with a lot of these challenges of the devil. This is just like a snapshot, like a ha 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 like scene of the devil by himself mm -hmm. about to do I don't know what. Mm -hmm. But to me, he's this one is, uh, I would call this painting about 86% finished. I will be finishing it this weekend. This one? Yes. I just need to detail some things. Everything is on it. Mm -hmm. There may be another line of grass up there, or, but the skulls and the lobsters and the clock need some just final details for me. Mm -hmm. um, this was really fun and very challenging painting this globe inside this monk, mm -hmm. inside this skull. Um, this, one's, this one's called, I believe it's called Global Resurrection. Yes. That's global resurrection. What was right. your first tattoo? I uh, got a little um, like crappy line drawing version of a uh, of um, a, a Jimi Hendrix fly, flying eyeball that like Rick Rick Griffin had drawn from a Jimi Hendrix concert poster on my ankle. I think I was like 16, this place in Jersey, Tattoo 46. A big old biker dude gave me the tattoo. And How did you pick the image? Uh, you know, it picked me, I think, you know, I just walked in there and... It's, it's, you didn't that, know before you walked in what no it was No idea, be. I just wanted it to, I just wanted my first tattoo. Mm -hmm. I was obsessed with tattoos. Because spending all that time in New York City, I was seeing tattoos. In Chatham, New Jersey, you didn't see tattoos. Mm -hmm. But being in the East Village, you saw people with tattoos and they were the scariest people on the street because they had tattoos. Tattoos were, you know, they weren't fashionable. They were a way of marking yourself as like the outside. Yeah. And I mean, I had friends growing up after we had gotten out of high school, but were still like around the area or they'd come home from college and stuff. And like their parents didn't want me to come over because I had tattoos. You know, that was a thing. And then all of a sudden, 
a lot of it, I was like, I was working at a tattoo shop. I was an apprentice in a tattoo shop when I got out of high school in Jersey. And uh, this is 91, but I'd say that was one of the last truly fantastic moments in American music, at least for me, was that era. So at that point in time, like then the music that was coming up that became so big, all these guys had tattoos. And it was like changing the world. It was changing fashion. It was changing the tastes of the world, that music. Anthony was like literally the most beautiful man on the planet at that time. And he had this most amazing beautiful tattoos and like uh like it changed people's perception of tattoos like right i saw it happen in the tattoo shop live like we were tattooing like thugs from the oranges in jersey and like garbage men and frat guys with their frat logos and stuff. So you worked in the tattoo salon? Yeah, I was like a, I would draw and make needles. Um, How do you make needles? You soldered them together. Like you'd buy, you'd get packs of needles mm -hmm. and you'd have a bar and you'd solder them together. You had jigs and you put X amount of needles in the jig, solder them together. It was a patience, a lot of patience to do that. But you got good at it and I would take pride in being good at it, you know? That was a great time and like the music was so crazy. Again, not to keep blowing smoke up your ass, but you were making a lot of it. Um, and I was working at this tattoo shop and at the same time there was, there was like a sort of like real uh, wave of like the rave scene happening in New York. And I, went with my boss at the tattoo shop. Uh, this guy, Carrie Brief was his name, is his name. And uh, we went to the limelight on a Wednesday to this party. old church. Yes, went to this party called Disco 2000. That was this like amazing party. It was fucking crazy, man. Nothing like it on the planet. I'd never seen anything like it. The club kids that were like on whatever. I remember they were on like a talk show one day in the afternoon. They were on like a Donahue type show or something like that. I knew all of these guys were guys I was hanging out with. But then also on, it was Tuesday, Wednesday was Disco 2000, but Tuesday or Thursday, I can't remember which one was like the industrial night with like ministry. And when you first walked in, we were talking about, you know, Nine Inch, I was listening to Nine Inch Nails, like they were playing that and stuff like that. And that was also a crazy party. It was so cool to go there on Wednesday and the freaks that were into that scene were there. And then the next night, a whole other subgenre of New York City and the surrounding boroughs would show up for this party. And it was so special. Did you ever go to Limelight? Absolutely. I mean, it was, that was, that couldn't happen today. I don't think. Yeah. There was an incredible club scene in New York all through the time that I lived there. Yeah. Nothing like it. Yeah. There was that, and NASA, which was down next to Wetlands. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Club USA opened, I remember, and Webster Hall. I remember going to like Webster Hall opening night with Michael Alec, that guy that ran this party Disco 2000, and he like ended up killing a drug dealer and hacking his body up and going to prison forever. And that, wow. there was a movie about him. Wow. He was my boss. Boss. Um, I got paid 75 bucks to go to the club and have fun, mm. you know? It was really cool. I remember there was like a room way up in the back of the back of the back of the VIP area that H.R. Geiger had done. Mm -hmm. Like all this furniture was like all sculptural stuff that he had made. That was so cool. Unbelievable. I finished this last night at the house. Really good. Thank you. Yeah, I did this one like... Look uh, at this guy. Yeah, the cloud monster's fun. Yeah. 
there's one up here too. There's this weird like goose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, oh yeah, and here there's another, like one of these oh, little yeah. beast clouds. Those are talking to that, that guy, James Enzer, that I brought up earlier over there. Mm. When you see these little weird monsters and whatever that are kind of floating through here, you don't really understand them. They're kind of a cross between things that would happen in an Enzer painting and those little rubber finger puppets that we had when we were living, those yeah, little yeah. monsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'm obsessed with those things. Always, yeah. I bought them at Dell's Novelty. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. So this is him seeing this whole, this is like a, if you, they're not the same size, but you could almost call this like a triptych mm -hmm. of, an, of a scene mm -hmm. of what's happening to him. So they would go. Yeah, they feel, at least these feel completely related. This one, when you explain what it is, makes sense. What's happening here? Just one of the journeys. There's a moment, this painting I made twice with two different figures. Remember in like cartoons, especially Roadrunner cartoons, where it would be like, he'd be running and the background would stay the same, would yeah. like repeat. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to like nod to that. There's this one and there's a larger version of it down there. Um, just the journey painting. This section of the journey is like really strong. And I feel like the beginning is also really thorough. The end, I could technically add to it. We'll get to the end, but the end just kind of start to feel like it's the beginning again. I see. There's definitely things that are happening in the end. It could very much be happening in the beginning. And I wanted that. Yeah. You know, he's still continuing on his yeah, journey. Yeah, He's on his journey. Then they kind of are like a group of them have come together. They're in absolute hellfire. The biggest evil is devil is watching over them in absolute darkness. And they're just reading the Tao. Yeah. <laughs> like I, they, for that scene, they don't, they, I wanted to paint them as though it's incredibly calm, no. that they're calm. For me, they're calm. Yes, you, you, I sense that they're calm. I really had fun with this painting. I'm very, very happy with this one. Yeah. The monkey knows something. Oh yeah. I believe this is called One Tree Hill. Yeah, after the U2 song. I love the U2. Then the next one, the devil's taken the castle mm -hmm. and the tree is vacant and dead. And uh, yeah, so this is almost like he's back here in this area and he thinks the devil is gone, mm -hmm. but he catches one of these guys. To me, he's caught one of these skeletons and in these two, here and here, he's, they're like interrogating this skeleton to like, where the fuck is the devil? Where did he go? Um, this is the first painting that started all of this. Wow. The Inquisition. Um, yeah. So, which is kind of fitting. Yeah, this one was great. So the lobsters there actually, one of these little monsters is in it. Like the whole framework of what I was going for happened in this one little painting. And you mm -hmm. could see why this, you sit down and you paint this out of nowhere on a Tuesday afternoon for no particular reason whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You could see why I felt the, the necessity to explore it a little bit further, you know? It's like the entrance to hell. Yeah. Because as you... And is that the moon? Sure. Like a very, like, bad Van Gogh moon. Yeah. On purpose. Yeah, yeah. Bad Van Gogh. Yeah, yeah. And it's really like it just kind of keeps coming in and being the cave, too. Like the way I painted the, the shine off the moon is just like the cave too. This one is also like, I've got these three in here that need work. It's that one that's behind here now, the devil in the field of skulls and this. So that's after I do this last painting, then I'm gonna come back and just do the touch up. Those are the fun bits yeah. where you're like, yeah, it's yeah. like mixing something, yeah, yeah. I guess, you know? 
Yeah, I've just like I made them, I started them, I got them to a place, and then I was like, okay, I'm gonna just finish it now. In at the end, I can wait till the end. So these are scenes in hell. He has taken the woman away to hell. So we have more raising of the dead. I don't know if that's the devil or if that's the devil or if they're both the devil. I don't know what's going on. She's standing there in the shadows, like not understanding what she's seeing. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of this next stretch is just going back, starting over, going out on this journey in the night. Mm -hmm. Here's sort of that repetition of like that, I was saying like the Roadrunner cartoon repetition of this is like a bigger version of that one down there in the darkness. This one's a banger. Wow. That's wild. Water comes into the equation here in wow. this painting, which I think is a pivotal moment. I don't know why, but it just is. And they get chains around him mm -hmm. and set him on fire. He just sets himself on fire. I don't know what happens, but the devil dies up there. Wow. So this would preclude this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is like some little pocket mm -hmm. of the woods, all of this is mm -hmm. going on. And then they get him and then he turns to hell or he burns and then it kind of, this is just a note. This is the devil dead, just laying dead. And he looks really happy about it. Mm -hmm. And the birds there. Yeah. The little mandolin guys Singing here. Singing a song. Yeah. Yeah. Just like, yeah, that was just, to me, just felt like a little, like it's, it's probably from some like uh, dance macabre art from mm -hmm. back in the day that was the source. And then like, so then I, I, I did this, this is a big zoom. And then I wanted to like, it's like spring has kind yeah. of sprung here. Yeah. And so this is just right after this. It's poof, he's gone. We have our little guy, he's still playing. There's new colors. There's much less happening. Mm -hmm. It's just him. This other guy can see the, like, this light has lifted. Mm -hmm. The little bird has come and sat on his hand. Mm -hmm. He's reunited with the girl. All these beautiful flowers are falling. Tell me about that moment when you're making something and you feel like I have to walk away. What would, the, what would be an example? Where would you be in the project? And what would the voice say? I mean, there was, when I first started to paint, I, was, I would draw so much, right? And I was really confident in my drawing. And then I'd get in front of a canvas and I would just fail instantly. And then I'd just paint over it. And then I'd start something else. I mean, you talk about this in your book too. It's like you, the, you walk away from it on a Tuesday and you feel like it's the greatest thing you've ever done in your life. And on Wednesday morning, it is dog shit. Yeah. And it is yeah. dog shit. So from like, when I really started to paint, I would say I was like 25. So from like 25 to 40, I drew and then I painted. And when I moved to California- You drew first and then painted the drawing? I would say, I, no, I would paint yeah. this much yeah. and I drew this much yeah. in my practice. I see. So I spent like 15 years predominantly drawing. Mm -hmm. My drawings would get big, they'd get complicated. They were really, you know, I'm proud of them. They were, they were remarkable. And hyper derivative of certain people very much on purpose. Mm -hmm. Because I looked at those people that I admired and I looked at how they worked. And that's what they did. They looked at the people that they liked before them and they copied the shit over and over and over and over and over and over again. 
I think one main difference in music is that it is quite possible to become hyper successful as a musician when you're a teenager and still be really fucking good at it when you're 70 years old. It's possible. It's possible, but not often. Not, not often, not, but it's, it's possible. Yes, yeah, it is possible. Painting, it's not possible. It's not possible. You just have to grow into it. You have to grow. Yeah. You have to have a life experience because paintings are generally not about This is not going to be right either. But you could write a song when you're 18 about the girl that broke up with you when you were 17, and it could become a classic song for the rest of time. Mm -hmm. You can't paint a painting at 18 to, to create that same thing at 18 with a canvas. One person I know of has done that. That was Basquiat. Like he, he did it all by the time he was 27 years old, and he had a mastery of the history of very specific history of art, but a mastery of it. And he liked all the artists that I liked and that I looked up to. And he had this way of looking, he created a way of art all art is talking to art that came before it. He had a way of taking art and turning it into the first Boogie Down record for me. The sampling and layering and bravado and mystery and violence and romance that were like, it was, they were identi like they were identical to each other to me. Visually and sonically, those are the closest, like, that's how I can put them together. Seeing his work for the first time did the same thing to me that that Boogie Down record did to me. What was the first time you came across his work? I was in my, like, I was probably like 24, something like that. Never heard of him before that. And a girl, my girlfriend at the time gave me a book for my birthday. And I was like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Paintings didn't look like that before. No. It was a new language. Yeah, and he was dead by the time I saw it, but not that dead. Yeah. You know? No, he was, His spirit he was, was just part... around in the same places that you were. Yes, yeah. No time ago. And I spent like a, you know, a really, and I'm still hyper influenced by him, hyper, hyper, hyper influenced, but unapologetically. Yeah. Somebody comes in, like I've had people come in here and be like, that looks like a Basquiat. And I'll say, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very, very, very much. Yeah. Because I've, I dove headlong into understanding him and his process and what motivated him and the corollaries were so strong between us minus the fact that i'm a white guy and he's a black guy uh, there were so many things that happened and the things we were both drawn to were so similar i felt like you know art is a conversation music is a conversation um you're talking to the people that did it before you and I decided to have a really, really in-depth conversation with Jean-Michel Basquiat mm -hmm. and find what that could do for me. I remember just being like, at first being like really scared of it and like wanting to like, that's where I would get lost on a canvas is I would try to not do the very thing that I should be doing, which was talk honestly and openly and copy what the hell that guy had done. Mm -hmm. And then I, embraced the conversation and my life changed drastically. Mm -hmm. And that's when those phone calls started coming and the, the great opportunities started rearing their heads and, and like, just it's like, yes, I am doing that. I am openly, publicly telling you, I spent my life copying what that guy did and making my own new fresh version of it because it is markedly different than what he did, but the structure is the same. Mm -hmm. 
identical structure. Mm -hmm. Because of the guys that I looked at, that's what they did. And then all of a sudden, they didn't need to do it anymore. And I'm just, over the last couple of years, feeling like that. I have done something unique in here that is mine, and I know that. Great. I had no plan other than that first little painting and being told not to do it. And then that encouragement from Damien, and then sort of, sort of set this parameter on myself that I had never done before, which was to make a gigantically ambitious body of it. There's 96 of these paintings. I've never made 96 paintings that went together. How do you um, pick the number? It was just kind of thrown at me by a friend. Like that, you can get there. Like if you do that many, you should feel done. And I started doing it. And that number for like the first hour after hearing that suggestion, I was yeah. like, I, I can't do that. That's insane, yeah. you know, that's crazy. I'm just one guy. Yeah. And then I came to the studio the next day and I made one. And I was like, well, there's one of them. <laughs> Come back tomorrow and do another one. And this turned into like, I've had many challenges with them as far as pushing myself and my technical abilities and finding things inside of myself that I didn't know that I had. And I will not say that it has been easy, but it has been effortless. Yeah. And I've had no self-doubt because I, I had no point where I, after that first hour of saying I couldn't do it. Yeah. And once I said I can do it, mm -hmm. I did it. Great. And I never was like, no, I'm not going to do this. I can't. I, I can't go on another day. About two weeks ago, my assistant, Ben, was with me, and we were in my house studio. I love painting at my house because I get to be around my son and my wife and not have to drive anywhere. Um, and I was kind of like, oh, I'm getting sick of this. I was at like 90 I was like, I just can't do any more of these. And instead of listening, I just had to say it. Yeah. And then I went right up to a canvas and I did the goddamn thing. And yeah. then I got really excited about it again. And I really fell in love with the whole process it's all an, over it's again. It's amazing how e even a small breakthrough yeah. changes the whole picture. Yeah. Changes our understanding of what's happening. Yeah. You know, I can never do that. I will never do this again. And then even a glimpse of something interesting is enough to is just enough to erase keep... that. Yeah, yeah. Like those battles that you have with yourself, they, they never go away, yeah. but they get a hell of a lot easier to win, right? Yeah. In a shorter period of time. Yeah. I've always won them, yeah. but some of those were 12 rounds and they were draws, you know? I've been going in and like having like, early Mike Tyson fights with my paintings, you know? And like, that is a good feeling. This was the first one that had water in it, but it was just this reflection and it was in the distance and I had a really hard time letting myself paint the water. I don't know why, because none of them had had water. Yeah. And I just was like, there can't be water there. It doesn't make sense. But I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And then it, came to be one of the ways that I could talk about what I wanted to talk about. Yeah, differentiating but I the didn't early know. part of the story from yeah. the world changed. Yeah. And so now this is like the end. They are back at this castle. Everybody's sort of proud and they're dressed up. I want him to feel like he's like touched. Yeah. By like everybody being thankful for what he did. Yeah. Because he doesn't really feel like he did anything except what he had to do. Yeah. You, you can see gratitude. I wonder what this one's called. Coronation. Mm -hmm. 
And then, yeah, there's just, you know, they're going to party again. Mm-hmm. He and the girl are, are dancing and fiddle players playing, and he's had her portrait painted and hung in the house. <laughs> and, and then he's finally just at rest, doing nothing. Mm-hmm. Back with a fruit plate. Great. So that's them all. That's all of them. It's a great story. Real adventure. Amazing, Thank you. amazing um, ride that you went on in your head yeah. for this to come out. It is just really kind of crystallizing that I understand that I'm really all I'm doing is yeah. just reiterating what I'm learning yeah. for over and over and over again. And but you're seeing, you're seeing an image and then you're seeing where that image fits in the story. Yeah. But I really do think it all just circles back to the Tao practice. Tell me about the first time um, your work was hung in a museum. Well, I remember in 2003, I got a call that um, the MoMA had bought a suite of drawings of mine from a gallery that I was working with at the time. But I never went to see it installed, but I'm pretty sure it was installed in this collection. Mm -hmm. Um, But then in 2014, I had sold stuff to museums in Europe, but I had never gone to see any of it. But then in 2014, I was given an opportunity to do like a sort of survey show at a place in Denmark called the Aros Museum, which is in a tiny college town called Aarhus. Um, It's one of the most magical towns I've ever been to in my life. They came to my studio in Brooklyn because I was still there when this was conceived but then by the time it was happening, I was living here. But the idea was to replicate my studio in Brooklyn inside of the museum because my studio is, you know, it's an interesting place. And the one in Brooklyn was smaller and jammed up and diff- it had a different vibe. I was a different person. So I lived at, at, at in a little apartment around the corner from the museum for a month and went and worked in the studio that they built me a footprint of Brooklyn in the museum. And I went there and made paintings and made it covered in paint and pinned little pictures all over the place and shipped my books, like everything. It was really cool. That was the most memorable experience I've had with a museum. Other things have gone to museums over the years, but I've never gone to, to visit them. Do you think there's a spiritual aspect to your work? For myself, absolutely. It's my, it's my practice. It's my, it's my uh, way of, one of the ways I can meditate and I can do it for many, 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 many hours. Um, zone, you just zone and I don't have to talk. That's one of the great things about this job is I don't have to speak to anybody to do it. So I can sit in absolute silence alone. Or even if there's music, I mean, you know, music can become the soundtrack to a silence that you need. Uh, even though it's on, it, it becomes that headspace you need. It creates an internal silence, right? Like a good song can can quiet your mind like nothing else. I, I think I touched on it earlier is like I would like for my paintings to make people feel something, to feel a desire to look at the world in a different way. One of the greatest things that happened in my work life, my, my uncle, I was very close to my uncle, Bill, 
and he um, had made me a copy of um, The Power of Intention, the Wayne Dyer um, lecture, that, and he gave it to me. And at the time, I had this big wall of CDs in my uh, studio. And I was about to start a project for Art Basel in 2004, I think it was. And he had given me this, this stuff. I took it, put it in my CD case. Couldn't even see it. And I went to reach up for something. And it's like this set of discs just shot out and landed on the floor. And I picked it up, thought of my uncle, walked over, put it in my six CD changer, turned it on, started this group of drawings I was gonna do. I drew all these drawings of myself dressed up as a zombie from a Halloween costume that I had had. And all I did was draw myself with a snake coming out of my head and blood all over me. And then I just wrote everything he was saying that meant something to me on these drawings, all over them. And I just listened to it for like a month. And then I went to Miami, we installed the stuff. I had no expectations of any kind. I wasn't killing it by any stretch of the, I was making a living, but I wasn't. And then um, I was just going to the beach and hanging out with friends and doing whatever during the day. Every 10 minutes, my phone kept ringing. Sold another one. Sold another one, sold another one, sold another one. Um, that was a turning point where, I, where I, I had always been writing on stuff, but what I was writing changed and what I was putting out changed. Um, the, I took, that was a stepping stone in my life where I was treating myself badly, but I needed to treat myself better and I had a moment where I did it and it made work that I was really proud of and it and it succeeded in helping me and it succeeded by going out into the world as well and it, it was successful in a many, myriad of ways. So that started a practice for me where I was really intentionally placing these texts that I was studying into my artwork all the time. And it was the beginning of me really, truly getting to make a real living at this. Amazing. Yeah. Let's look at the Tao, and I want you to randomly open to a page and read to me what's there. And let's see how it impacts what we're feeling today. You know what? Just do this. This is really easy. Okay. Get the Dow app, everybody. <laughs> it's really easy. Can you pick a random one? I just did. Great. Without going out the door, you can know the world. Without looking out the window, you can see heaven. The farther you travel, the less you know. Thus the wise person knows without traveling, understands without seeing, accomplishes without acting. Mm -hmm.